Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to be looking at accounting harmonization. And specifically, we're going to be looking at this topic from a historical background. So in this session, you're going to see a lot of history as well as you're going to see a lot of acronyms for organization that were involved in this accounting harmonization. This topic is obviously covered in international accounting. I doubt that this will be covered on the CPA exam. Actually, I can state it will not be covered on the CPA exam. As always, I would like to remind you, my viewers, to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, please uh, make sure you create one. It's very important for your professional image as well as network ability. YouTube is where I house all my lectures. Please like my lectures, share them, put them in the playlist. If you like my lectures, there's someone else who would benefit from them as well. Please share the wealth. I'm also growing my Instagram account. Please connect with me on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram and like my Facebook page. If you're looking for a CPA premium material, I do have some product on Gumroad and I do have a website. So let's talk about this international harmonization of accounting standards. So this is going to be like basically background information. If you remember from the prior lecture, we learned that accounting diversity exists and because that diversity exists, it created challenges. Okay. So what happened is the accounting profession, um, it's under pressure to do what? To eliminate those diversity, to reduce the challenges. And what are the main challenges? Well, one thing we talked about is cost. Well, it's going to cost a lot of money. Cross-listing. If you're going to list on another stock exchange, there's, there's a lot of requirement you have to um, comply with. You're going to have limited access to, to capital market. Um, investment decision, lending decision, those are all challenges because we have accounting diversity. So the accounting profession and the standard setters have setters have been under pressure from who? From multinational companies, stock exchanges, multinational companies, they want to reduce their cost, obviously, the cost of compliance. Stock exchanges, they want more companies to be listed. Securities regulators, it's easier for them to monitor the system. International lending institution, international investors, the World Bank, they all want to reduce that complexity. Okay, why? Because it's easier for everyone. If we are using the same accounting standard, it's easier for everyone to make decisions. Okay. So they want to reduce diversity and harmonize accounting standard and practices internationally. So we're going to be looking at, in this session, we're going to be looking at the International Accounting Standard Committee or IASC. And this committee is basically gone. Now we have the IASB, the International Accounting Standard Board. Basically, the IASB is a continuation of the IASC. But it's very important to look at the IASC from a historical perspective to see how things evolved over time. Okay, They're both private entities and they are the main players in the harmonization and convergence effort with the support of accounting bodies, standard standard setters, as well as capital market regulators, government authorities, and financial statement preparers. Okay. So, so what is accounting harmonization? Well, accounting harmonization is when you allow countries to have different standards as long as they don't conflict. So it doesn't have to be the same as long as they don't conflict. Now, we can look at harmonization in two different ways. Harmonization of accounting regulation or standard and harmonization of accounting practices. Standard and regulation, basically, it's what's written down. It's the same thing. But when it comes to practices, we might have different practices or we might have the same practices. So harmonization is a process that reduce alternative while retaining a high degree of flexibility in accounting. So what you do is rather than everyone using a different method, you want to reduce harmonization reduces those alternative at the same time, keep in flexibility, keep in flexibility. Okay. Now bear in mind, harmonization is different than standardization or uniformity, which implies the elimination of alternatives and harmonization. You might have more than one method. Okay, you would reduce the alternatives, but you will have more than one. And the objective or, of harmonization is to have comparable financial statements from companies in different countries. And that's the main problem. The main problem is if, if I'm an investor, if, I'm a, if I am a lender, how do I make a decision if I need to lend money in another country if they're using a different system? Okay. Harmonization of regulation, which is called de jour harmonization, which is the harmonization of the standard, does not necessarily produce harmonization of practices. Although you, you have the same rules in different countries, but the way that rule is being implemented, it could be different in practice, which is de facto 
harmonization, which we'll, we'll look at some of the reasons. Now, keep in mind, we're not talking about convergence yet. We're going to keep convergence. We'll discuss later. Convergence is a little bit different. It's the enforcement of a single set of accepted standard by regulatory bodies. And this is one possible definition of convergence. Again, we'll talk about convergence later on because you don't want to confuse convergence with, with harmonization. So why de facto harmonization is difficult? Why is it difficult to have similar practices? There are many reasons. We look at them in prior lectures, legal reasons, basis for account. Quality of audit may not be the same in different countries. Different countries might have different standards. For example, in the US, we have the PCAOB, which is the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And the reason why we have PCAOB because we have a series of uh, uh, security uh, of accounting fraud, which led to securities fraud. Therefore, the government uh, had more. Now they have more oversight over the auditors. Well, that may not be the case in different countries. So different countries will have different requirements. Therefore, the way you're gonna do, you're gonna be doing auditing in one country, it will be different in another because each country is different. And we talked about this earlier. Uh, also, enforcement mechanism. Uh, how do you enforce your securities? Uh, laws, how do you enforce if somebody violated accounting rules? Is it criminal offense? Is it a civil offense? For example, in the US, we have the SEC. The SEC does not prosecute. If there's any federal case, will the FBI will prosecute. So in different countries, the rules might be different. Again, cultural differences. We talked about this. Um, some, some, some cultures are more secretive. Others are transparent that require more disclosure. For example, Asian, usually in Japan, they're more secretive. The US and the UK, they don't, they don't have no problem having more disclosure. And we talked about, about why in prior session. Legal requirements, for example, if there is a violation of an accounting principle, what type of penalties do you, do you, do you, do you impose? Is the state involved? Is the court involved? Is the only the private accounting setting standard body, in, uh, body involved? Do you get slapped on the hand? For example, in some countries, bribery is not, is, is not illegal. In the US, bribery is illegal. So how do you how do you actually record a transaction if it's you know in the U.S. that's illegal in another country it is legal? How do you harmonize the practices so you you could appreciate the the the, the differences and the difficulty? Also, you might have different socioeconomic and political system. For example, what's the state role? Uh, what's the legal system legal system? Is it common law? Is it code law? Those are difficulties. Okay. Now, most of the harmonization efforts started with the IASC, because that's the oldest organization, quasi-international organization. It was established in 1973 by an agreement of the leading professional accounting bodies in 10 developed countries or 10 countries, the US, the UK, the main countries. Um, it's, it was, the, its main objective was to issue international accounting standard, okay? And to do what? To have harmonization, to kind of have the, reduce the alternatives as much as possible. And the life of the ISC can be broken down into three phases. The first phase, which is the first phase, what they looked at is the lowest common denominator approach. What they did, they looked at the rules that are most common between all the different countries, and they try to create those IAS, International Accounting Standard, IAS, based on that lowest common denominator. And that was from uh, 1973 until 1988, it's considered the first phase of, of its life. It issued 26 international accounting standard, uh, for example, construction contract. Um, that's when they said, well, there are two acceptable methods. Hopefully you know what they are, percentage of completion and the completed contract method. For example, all countries would either use the percentage of completion or the completed contract method. Those are the two acceptable methods. Okay. Usually allowed multiple options, so they did not really limit you to any particular option, but they gave you the most common one, but it produced little or no comparability of financial statements across the country. So this was the start of this international effort, but they issued 26 standards, but those 26 standards did not really increase the comparability. The second phase took place in the next five years from 1989 till 1993. And there was two major activities during those years. The first one is they issued what's called the publication, a framework for the preparation and presentation of financial statements, also known as the framework. So they issued the framework. And in the framework, they talked about the objective of financial statements. Why do we prepare financial statements? The qualitative characteristics, the definition of financial statement elements, the definition of financial, um, the criteria for recognition of financial statements. Now, all these 
topics we're going to talk about when we talk about the IASP. So we're going to look at them from an international perspective, but this was the beginning of them, 1989, 1993. This is when they were published for the first time. Okay. Also, what they wanted to do, they wanted to start a comparability of financial statement project. And what they did, they reduce or eliminate certain choices. For example, um, if we go back to the percentage of completion and the completed contract method, now what they did, they put more restriction when you would use either or. So they put a little bit more rules to eliminate choices and to have more harmonization or more comparability. The third stage or the final stage, it was uh, basically it's known as the International Organization of Securities Commission Agreement, 1993 to 2001. This is when the IASC and the International Securities Commission, the, the, the International Organization of Securities Commission, they try to work together. Now, you might be saying, why? Well, to solve the problem of cross-listing. If one company, if a U.S. company wants to list in Europe or a European company wants to list in the U.S., what can we do to help them? Okay. So they created a set of international standards endorsed by this organization, this international securities organization for cross-listing purposes. So they agreed on 30 core standards. So they created a 30 core standard. And in May 2000, 14 of the largest developed countries, developed countries accepted the 30 core standard to gain access to the country's capital market. So as long as you use those standard, you can cross-list. And what happened? After 2001, we have the creation of the International Accounting Standard Board, and we'll see later on shortly in the session what were the challenges for the IASC, and in the next session we'll talk more about IASB, which is the current board, and this is, this is the most important. Okay. Now, was the IASC the only player in the harmonization effort? Of course, no. We already saw that the International Organization of Securities uh, Commission they, they were they, they, they're interested. Um, other other players were the International Federation of Accountant, IFAC, European Union was a major player, International Forum on, on Accountancy Development, and other players such as the UN and other international blocks. Let's talk about a little bit a little bit shortly about each of these players and talk about the difficulty of the the challenges that uh, that 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 face the IASC, the International Federation of Accountancy. It's a global organization of 158 member bodies, associate in 123 countries. They represent 2.5 million accountants employed in public, practice, industry, commerce, government, and academia. Its mission is to serve the public interest and to strengthen the worldwide accountancy profession and to contribute to the development of strong international economies by establishing and promoting adherence to high high quality professional standard on audit, auditing ethics education and training and obviously you can see that there could be an, a disagreement between this organization and the iasc and that's it, that's one of the reasons why the asc was one of the reasons was dissolved because there was a disagreement with this organization in may 2000 IFAC and the large international accounting firm established a forum of firms also aim at raising standard of financial reporting and auditing globally in order to protect the interests of cross-border investors and promote international flow of capital. Okay, so once again, this is one of the organizations that help in this harmonization effort. The second party that helped in this uh, accounting harmonization effort is the European Union. And obviously because the European Union is, is is a geographical block and it's it's one of they have most of the developed countries so but bear in mind the european union is changing especially in the past decade when they included former soviet union block countries so it's not as developed as uh, as uh, no northern europe or western europe um, the aim of the eu is to create a unified business environment and obviously if you need to create a unified business environment accounting is going to play a part of it so you want to create a unified accounting uh, accounting rules. Uh, two directives has been aimed at harmonizing accounting in the EU. The, EU, the, the fourth directive, which is that's what they call them, those decision issued in 1978, deals with valuation rules, disclosure requirement, and the format of the financial statement. And the seventh directive issued in 1983, dealt with consolidated financial statements. So the fourth directive was a little bit more comprehensive. It have comprehensive accounting rules covering the content of annual financial statement, the presentation, measurement, disclosure of both public and private companies, 
and fair value is fair value measurement how do you measure something at fair value whether it's an asset or a liability okay so bear in mind uh, that those rules provide consider considerable flexibility therefore it did not lead to complete comparability across member nations they tried their most but it did not it did not lead to that comparability but it helped reduce differences in financial statements so Again, even within the EU, you have different cultures, you have different countries, so bear that in mind. In 1995, the EU decided to adopt effort undertaken by the International Accounting Standard Council toward broader international harmonization. It said no more accounting directives, now we're going to go with this council, whatever they decide, which eventually became again the I, which we're going to talk about later, became IASB. some of the challenges faced by the IASC over the years. One, one complaint was it lacked legitimacy because it was created by the accounting profession, which was a private sector with its own self-interest. It doesn't mean that's true, but that's the perception. For example, the UN com constantly complained about this. The IASC also faced problem of legitimacy with, in regard to constituent support, independence, and technical expertise. For example, the board members work at the uh, the, the international standard setting were only part-time, so they were not committed full-time, which has showed a lack of commitment, and they were not necessarily selected because of their technical expertise, okay? Which that's, that gave doubt to them. They may not be, they may not be developing the highest possible uh, quality uh, of accounting standards. U.S. reaction was also a, a major challenge. In 1996, I believe FASB found differences in 74% of accounting standards. What does that mean? It means then when FASB did a study and they compared the, the international accounting standard to the U.S. gap, what they found is it's not comparable at all. There is a differences in 74% of accounting standard, which is that's a huge difference. That's not even close to comparability. And there was some disagreement with the IFAC. Basically, they disagreed on who is the boss who should be issuing those international accounting standards. So in response to these challenges and others, and other challenges other than those, uh, what they did is they appointed a new committee, uh, appointed a committee called Strategy Working Party in 1996, which ended up with recommending changes that gave the birth to what we're going to be looking at next, the International Accounting Standard Board. IASP, which is IASP, which is going to be starting to be issuing the I, IFR, IFRS that, that we need to learn about in this course. If you have any questions, any comments about this uh, about this recording, please please email me. Otherwise, study hard. If you happen to visit my website for additional lectures, please consider donating. Good luck.